David. And I'm not sure where David is from here. But he's asking a question I'd like us to answer. He says, how come Jesus never collected offerings? Even though he preached so much about, maybe about it you want to say. Was he self-sufficient or were there other reasons why he did not? This is very, very interesting. He says, how come Jesus never collected offerings? Who told you? Who told you Jesus never collected offerings? Okay. Maybe I should let somebody speak oh. first. I think Jesus collected offerings because he had a treasurer. He had a treasurer. Yes, he did. And yeah. um, Judas. And this, the treasury was so, was so fat that even when Judas took out of the treasury, um, they didn't know. And, <laughs> and Bible talks about... Jesus had to tell John? Yes, John, Jesus had to tell John mm -hmm. about it. And um, Jesus had certain women who went um, with him and the Bible says they ministered to him. And there are other times that um, uh, even, even at the Last Supper, when Jesus told um, Judas. Um, Judas to go out to do something, all disciples thought that he had sent him on an errand to do something that was financial. So yeah. obviously Jesus took... Maybe I should offense. read... There's, a, there's a, a place he just referred to. I want to read it to you. And this is in Luke's Gospel, chapter number 8, beginning with verse 1. He says, And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. Notice, I want you to notice what he says. And the twelve were with him. Talking about the twelve disciples. They were with him. Then you have a comma there. Verse 2 says, And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, and then he says, talking about who these women were, he says, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod steward, and Susanna, says, the twelve were with him, and these, these women were with him. And then he says, and many others, many others, countless number of people, who were with him. He says, which ministered unto him of their substance. The twelve were with him. These women that were listed here were with him. And then he says, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. Think about it. That's offering. <laughs> the ministry was well funded. That's it. That's exactly what he's talking about. See. So, anyway, um, you were wrong to have thought that Jesus didn't collect offerings. And Judas Iscariot was the... Was the was a treasurer and he wasn't just going somewhere else to find money no this was the money that they got from the meetings from these people these many who ministered to Jesus of their substance that's what the Bible says pastors also in the book of Mark chapter yeah. 12 it talks about how Jesus stood over the treasury and watched as people were coming to give their offerings where he was watching and he didn't condemn it right mm -hmm. no sir Welcome to the Christian Life YouTube channel where faith is built through God's Word. Kindly like and subscribe for more. Hallelujah. So Wednesday night we began sharing on the Christian life. And like I said, we started dealing with and we will be dealing with marriage and the home children singles and single parents and single parenting divorce and remarriage neighborhoods and the workplace relationships sex sexual abuse and perversion and if you don't like to hear these kind of things in church, you are at liberty. I know when I start talking about certain things, some of you go red. 
you just turn red looking at me there last Wednesday I observed there were some of you who weren't turning right or left you just turned straight this way sometimes we could hear a pin drop see so don't fight me if I hit you below the belt I didn't plan to but you see there are a lot of things along these lines that we may learn so much about faith and never learn we may pray in tongues for a long time and never learn them we may be filled with the Holy Ghost and never learn them see we can talk a lot about prayer and still have problems in these areas many times people don't have in fact nobody ever has a problem with God people have problems with themselves John said how in the world can you love God whom you have not seen if you do not love the people that you see so our relationship with God a lot of times will be determined and uh, will be determined by our relationship with human beings and actually our perception of God will be reflected by our relationships with people everywhere at home and abroad praise God praise God praise God Wow, wow, wow. I got some letters here. I'm actually wondering where to begin from. Um, I want to start to share, first of all, um, along certain lines before we begin asking questions and answering the ones that have answers praise the Lord first I want to mention something about sex outside of marriage you say wow wow sex in church I thought he was going to talk about Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I want to talk about sex outside of marriage to begin with. Praise the Lord. The Bible talks about it. And I will talk about what the Bible talks about. I'm called to talk about what the Bible talks about, the way the Bible talks about what it talks about. You agree with me? Yes. Okay. So, we'll begin. Second Samuel, Second Samuel in Chapter Thirteen. Second Samuel chapter 13 a little of a popular story not too popular but fairly and I'm reading from verse 1 chapter 13 and it came to pass after this that Absalom the son of David had a fair sister or a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was the first son, the eldest son of David. Absalom was uh, the third son. And Tamar uh, had the same mother with Absalom. Amnon had a different mother. You know, David had... Uh, several wives 
Well, the Bible says Absalom had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. They had the same father. They had the same father. This guy loved his younger sister. His younger half sister. He loved her. He loved her. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> wow. And Ammon was so vexed about this love, you know, that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Ammon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. He thought it hard for him. Why? Because, you know, she wasn't found in the street. She wasn't always around. The king's virgin daughters were kept uh, in a particular area, different from where the guys were. And they had special clothes on. By which you would know they were not only the king's daughters, but they were also unmarried. Now look at this. He, he thought it hard for him to do anything to her. He wanted to, but he thought it hard, difficult. He wanted a way out, but it was difficult. So he became sick about it. He was thinking of what to do. He was thinking of what to do. You know, some people have never really understood the human person. The human person is so, so powerful, so powerful. It is said that anything that you think about so much, so deeply, that you give a, a great deal of thought to, something that you give a great deal of thought to, sooner or later, by some indescribable means, will pull to you men or materials or circumstances that align with it to you sooner or later. The human person is so powerful. You know, sometimes we think that God did some things. The guy says, I prayed, I told God, if, if she's mine, let her come my way. And so, when I pray, it happened. She came. She didn't come because God sent her to you. You walked it up. You say, how in the world is that possible? It's possible. It's possible. The human person is so powerful. It's possible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, just because it happened, doesn't mean it came from God. It can happen and not be of God. Amen. Well, well, now look at this. He thought it hard for him to do anything to her. That's the latter part of verse 2. Now look at verse 3. But Ammon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. The son of Shimea, David's brother. That's Amnon's own cousin. And Jenadab was a very subtle man. Who is the first person described as subtle in the Bible? Satan. He was a very subtle man. He was a schemer. He was good in these things. You understand what I mean? He had a keen mind when it came to this. He knew precisely what to do. Now the Bible says that Ammon had a friend. His cousin was his friend. Now, 
Look at verse 4. And he said unto him, Why art thou being the king's son lean from day to day? Who told you he was lean? Just the way the devil does it. Why can't you eat up every tree? That's what he did back there in the garden. He said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Anybody ever ask you, How come you're losing weight? Will thou not tell me? And Ammon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. I'm in love. Oh, I'm in love, he said. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see, to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat, food, and dress the food in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. What a schema. What a scheme. So Ammon, he, he, he took it. Ammon laid down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Ammon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat it at her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Ammon's house and dress him meat. Come on. Who is he talking about? Ammon and his sister. His sister. See, the father didn't say anything wrong with that, so he said, hey, go to your brother's place. He wants you to do something for him. And she went. Like Abraham, not knowing where she was going. Hallelujah. Not knowing. Now look at this. Wow. So Tamar went to her, uh, to her brother Amnon's, Amnon's house. That's verse 8. And he was laid down. And she took flour and kneaded it. And made cakes in his sight. And did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him. But he refused to eat. And Ammon said, have out all men from me. You know, because he, he's, the, he's the king's first son. He's got a little palace of his own. And there are men all over the place. So he says, get them all out. I got a job to do. And Ammon said unto Tamar, bring, verse 10, bring the meat into the chamber. She went in, he went into the chamber. Bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat, at, eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Ammon, her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. You would think, Oh, come lie with me, my sister. You would think, Well, it's not time she's tired, so he's saying, Why don't you lie on this bed? Uh uh. Uh -uh. You see, this is a language here that we need to understand. The reply will tell you what the guy meant to say. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. See, she had some sense. She said, why don't you talk to the king? Definitely, you see, it's obvious yet, she loved her brother. Not because she wanted to marry him. But she loved her brother. And she was honest with him. And told him the truth. 
She said, it's wrong. Don't do this. You'll be as one of the fools in Israel. Where am I going to cause my shame to go? Don't force me. Talk to the king. Well, verse 14. How bet he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Did you hear that? Forced her and had sex with her, okay? That's exactly what the Bible is saying. Stupid, wasn't it? Verse 15. This is terrible. Then Anon hated her exceedingly. Hated her. Hey! A moment ago, he was a dying because he wanted to have her. Now, he's got her. He doesn't want her. I read an article in a magazine some time ago. And uh, the title of the article was... Um, now that he's got you, why doesn't he want you? Are you still there? Mm. <laughs> oh, hallelujah! You might as well say praise the Lord, because this is as holy as all we've been talking about, about faith and the Holy Ghost. Say praise the Lord. Verse 15, then Ammon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he, he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Ammon said unto her, Arise, be gone. He was through his thing. And she said unto him, There's no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servants that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out, out from me and bolt the door after her. And she had a garment of divers colors upon her, for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of divers colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Had Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wrought. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Or Tamar, actually. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I said, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We learned some lessons from this. See, sometimes you find two people are engaged. They say they want to get married. They're looking forward to getting married. When are you getting married soon? But then, somewhere along the line, the guy is beginning to think of somebody else. He's beginning to think of somebody else. In other words, he's about changing his mind. The girl doesn't know where it came from. If he ever slept with you, you are sunk. Because this is the principle. When he sleeps with you, you ladies, when he does, you are naked. Then he sees you beyond all he ever saw. Now he's going to say, your nose is too big. Your ears are standing out like dog's ears. Your nostrils are too wide. Your lips are too thick. 
your hair is too short and you're, you are bow-legged. <laughs> you don't know how he came about it. He never told you that. No, he didn't see that because he took your pants off. He saw that because he slept with you when he wasn't supposed to. The fact is, now he's got you, he doesn't want you. That's exactly what we just read. The man wanted the lady, wanted her so bad until he got her. When he was through with her, he didn't want her. Many, many Christian relationships that break before their marriage, many of them end up here when they have sexual relations with each other. Many of them end up here. Some don't quite end up. But the real love stops at that point. The rest is by force. Somebody trying to do something. See, God is showing us the principle. Do not sleep with somebody whom you have not married. There are several implications. Number one, you, the guy, will get to dislike her. So you, the lady, you run the high risk of being disliked at the end of it. You will think, you know, he's crying. Somebody said, well, I had to sleep with him because he was on his knees. He was begging me to sleep with him. So I went and did it. You are a fool. You are a fool. You would think that sleeping with a guy is a proof of love. No, it is not a proof of love. Sex is not a proof of love. It has never been and never will be a proof of love. God has never said it is a proof of love. Well, we thought we're, we, we, we were going to get married anyway, so why didn't we just go on? What's wrong with it? We we're going to get married anyway. No. It's wrong. When something is wrong, it is wrong. You see, in the sight of God, sin is an absolute. If it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's a sin, it's a sin. If it's a sin today, it will be a sin tomorrow. Sin is sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, well, our wedding was supposed to be tomorrow morning. Doesn't make any difference. You were not married the previous day. See, God has shown us what to do. He has told us. The Bible says he has shown the old man what is right. God has already shown us in his word what to do. So, number one, you run the risk of being disliked at the end of it. Some, like I said, do go ahead and get married. But that's the end of real love. Except, of course, until God does something about it. When you do something about it. Because there you're sunk. The guy who threw out your relationship never shouted at you. He never did it. Never hit you. Now he has to hold his hands, you know, for the temptation of slapping you. He cared so much. Anything you wanted, he got it for you. Now he's even tired of seeing you. He doesn't know what you're wearing. Before, every little snacky thing you put on, he said, <laughs> Wow! <laughs> now he doesn't even see it. He doesn't see it anymore. He used to tell you, you're the most beautiful, sweetest thing in the world.
Now, he comes back from work, comes back and he thinks you're getting too fat now. Watch your weight now. You weren't any fatter. Watch your weight now. What's wrong with your hair? He's even troubled about that. You know, some ladies, oh, bless their hearts. Hallelujah. Come on now. Hey, you man. Oh, no, I said, hey, you man. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. The lady said, I, I, I'm tired of buying towers. Why? Oh, I can't bear to have my husband use my towel. Because when he starts using it, she said, it really starts smelling. Now all the men have their heads straight. <laughs> you, <laughs> Lord, hallelujah. But you see, there can be a problem. Let's come back to this thing. You run the risk of being disliked. That's number one. And it's usually so. That's when you lose your respect. Believe me. Believe me. Don't you say, Oh, well, in our case, when we were through, he loved me more. No! A thousand times no. He can feign it. He can feign it. He can pursue it because he's stuck with you. So he has to stick with you. You know what I'm talking about? So, you know, he's got to go on. After all, he's got an investment here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The next thing, now, now let me say this to you, why it's so wrong. Some of you are, um, there are some who are quite young here. The only thing is in our world today, some of the younger ones, they know more than the older ones. They are more adventurous in these things nowadays. Because they have all the books, they have all the films. They watch anything. <laughs> Some of you parents, you don't know what your nine-year-olds are watching. They know all the stuff. Meanwhile, you watch this program on TV, you tell them, leave, leave here, leave here, leave here. <laughs> they shake their heads and check out. <laughs> they know more than mommy. <laughs> hey, try a peep into their bags and you'd be shocked. They carry some of those magazines with them. They know all the names. You don't even know the names now. They do know the latest nomenclature. Praise the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? So number one, that's the risk. Then secondly, which is more terrible, when you, hear me now, when you sleep with someone, according to the Bible, well, let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Are you there? I'm reading from verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Glory to God. The belly for meats. Well, where am I? Yeah. Meats for the belly, verse 13. Meats for the belly. And the belly for meats. 
But God shall destroy both it and them, both the belly and the food. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. What is fornication? What is fornication? You see, we have, let's call a spade a spade. If you sleep with a guy or a, a, a guy who's not your husband, or the guy sleeps with a girl who's not his wife, whether or not you're getting married tomorrow morning, you have committed what the Bible calls fornication. That's what you committed. Even if you prayed before you started. <laughs> oh yeah! You know, that devil is a deceiver. They could join their hands and say, Father, as we join our hands and make our hearts one, we are planning for tomorrow. <laughs> sin is sin. You know, there's another thing the devil does to people. He says, well, thinking about it is as bad as doing it. Why don't you go ahead and do it anyway? You're already defiled by thinking about it. So you say, well, 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 I thought about it, so I'm defiled, so I might as well go on. So you go on, and then you're stuck. Because you didn't feel as bad when you thought about it, but now you've done it, you want to die. <laughs> oh yeah, the Bible says a man is tempted. Hear this. A man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Lust, when it has conceived, bring it forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bring it forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. That's what the Bible says. Are you here? Well, well, well. He says, no, well, what are we reading? The Bible tells us here, now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. It is not for fornication. Did you hear this? He's telling you what your body was fashioned for. It's not a sex machine. Did you hear that? There are things that are done to the human body and your lifespan is shortened. Fornication is one of them. It shortens the lifespan. You say, well, I thought sex was, uh, you know, there are a lot of books out now. They even tell people, they even tell people, you want to be supercharged for ideas, go for women. Oh yeah, you want to be supercharged. So, they tell them what it will do to their subconscious mind. And everybody wants to be successful. And so they try it out on a lady to be hypercharged. I never forget, there's a, you, some of you would have been already acquainted with this. There's a nice book on success, and I, I love the way this Christian writer um, tried to get his materials together. Really, really impressive. So, another man, a non-Christian, had written a book on success. Financial success, material success. And then he mentioned the names of certain financiers of America. Mentioned about nine of them. As good examples of great successes. Well, he didn't tell us the end of the story. Look, I want to tell you something. The Bible is still the best document on success in every area of life. Because it tells you the beginning of a man's life and the end of a man's life. And lets you make your decision of whatever road you want to follow. But then he advises you and instructs you on the right road. He tells you the beginning, everything, to the end. Well, this man talked about these nine guys and never did mention their end. The Christian writer made a better research and put their lives there. These same guys mentioned them and then told us what happened to them 23 years later. 
23 years later, not one of the nine ended up well. Not one. These were nine of America's richest men about 1923. But not one of them, 23 years later, ended up well. Not one. It's not the way man is in his beginning. Is whether, whether he ended up well. Oh, you say, well, how, how are we going to know if we're going to end up well? Depends on who you're following. If you follow the man who ended up well, you sure end up well. Can you say amen? amen. I'm following the ones who ended up well. Abraham, David, thank God, Paul, hallelujah, and Jesus. I have their stories. And they all did well. Okay, so now we're reading. He says, now the body is not for fornication but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He's telling you what your body is not for and what it is for. Your body is for the Lord. God wants to use your body. And that's why he gave you a body. You didn't have to have a body to exist. Believe me. You didn't have to have a body. You're a spirit being. You don't have to have a body to be alive. Because when a man comes out of his body, he still lives. But God said he gave us a body to function for him in this world. Amen? I said amen. amen. All right. So... <clears throat> Now look at verse 14. And God had both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ? Hear this. Hear this. This is important. He says, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Shall I then take... He says, don't you know that your body... Your body, the members of your body, your hands, your legs, and so on, are the members of Christ. He says, shall I then take the members of Christ, the members of Christ, and make them one with an harlot? Now, I want you to understand, we're not just looking at a harlot here. We're not talking about a harlot here. What I want you to pick there is, sleeping with a harlot, as he's telling you, is making yourself, the members of your body, one with the harlot. Now, it makes no difference whether the fellow is a harlot or not. The idea here is, when you sleep with someone, you make yourself one with the fellow. Verse 16, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two said, he shall be one flesh. Did you hear that? He says, he that is joined to an harlot is one body. With the harlots. How? Through sexual relations. He is joined to the harlot. So he becomes one with the harlot. Their bodies become one. He says for two of them will become one flesh. How? Did you notice he didn't talk about marriage here? Did you notice he didn't talk about a ceremony here? He's talking about fornication. And fornication is sexual relationship between two unmarried partners. So they're joined together by such sexual union, and so the Bible says they become one. Now what's the implication of this? Look at this. You study the Bible very well, and you understand what I'm talking about. Now when a lady gets married to a man, she takes on the man's name. Is that right? I want you to know it's beyond the name. The name is just the best way to identify her. It's more than a name. It's more than a name. When you sleep with someone, when you have sex with someone, hear me, you take on to you that fellow's character. How many of you have noticed when two people are married, in the process of time, they start looking, like, uh, looking alike? It even works on their bodies. They may fight every year, but somehow, somehow, Somebody will soon walk up to you and say, you look like so-and-so. <laughs> oh, Lord. They seem to behave alike. 
Certain things just start working out together. Why? It's not just a resemblance. It's not an outward resemblance. It's spiritual. It's from within. Every characteristic trait of that individual you have taken into your health. It's in your body. It may not show up, but it's in your body. You know, it's not all the genetic qualities that we, we receive from our parents that are manifested uh, openly. Some are just there, silently. But one time or the other, they just show up. You know what I'm talking about. The same thing when these guys get together. If he had any sickness from birth, you bought it. You say, no, but I've I never been sick like that. I'm telling you, you got it. You are a heir to his sickness. Oh yeah, you are a heir to his sickness. If he's been having failure in his life, you are a heir to his failure. Now hear this, everything that he ever had in his life is mixed with yours. Not legally, it's more than that. Legally, yeah! But more importantly, vitally. It's there beyond what you know. When the Bible says two of them become one flesh, he's telling you something that is very scientific. It's real. So go ahead and mess with them. Sleep with the guy. He has his brain upside down. You got it too. <laughs> See, so that, that's taken unto you. It's an identity. You've identified yourself with him. It's a covenant of oneness. It's a blood covenant of oneness. And so all that belongs to him belongs to you. And don't you think about money. <laughs> oh yeah, because a lot of times when we talk like this, people are looking about, oh, well, his money belongs to me, his house belongs to me. No, his failure, his sickness, his sins, they're all yours. Look back in the Old Testament. When the, when, the, when the man sinned, God said, bring all his house out. Finish them all. Only the man sinned. He said, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the children to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. What do you think he's talking about? When Achan sinned, they said, bring out his wife, his children, everybody. He was the only one who sinned. Please turn the tape over for the continuation of this message. God is saying that nature is in all of them. But thank God, in the New Testament, every one of us can go to Jesus on our own. Thank God, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things have passed away, even if your parents messed up. Thank God you're delivered from that mess. Amen. Amen. That's the grace of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So you don't, don't just go out here and sleep with somebody. Second thing, which is worse. See, not only have you taken onto you by, now you say, well, I didn't quite marry him. By sleeping with him, you bought all those things. They belong to you. And you go from there. You leave from there. You may eventually marry another person. But you're going to get into that marriage with certain carryovers from another life. You are a hybrid. <laughs> I didn't say that to be funny, it's just true. It's just true. You are in covenant relationship with another. You say, well, we didn't sign any papers. No, you signed in blood. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You signed in blood. The third one, which is worse, When you sleep with someone who's not married to you, you have sinned and therefore have stepped outside of God's blessing into a curse. And the fellow with whom you did it 
has stepped outside of God's blessing into a curse by that sin. And by that sin also, you become a partaker of his sins and he becomes a partaker of your sins. Worse. So both of you are under a curse. He said, but we haven't felt so in our lives. Everything you're going to do. Everything you're going to do. Every step you're going to take. You may sing Amazing Grace for ten years. How sweet the sound. You're under a curse. You live under that curse. It goes with you. God wants to bless you. You may pray. God wants to bless you. But he cannot bless you beyond what you let him. See what I'm talking about? Now sometimes people feel that the problem, you know, they can't sleep with anybody. But so long as she doesn't get pregnant. She got pregnant. It's not worse. You only have more physical responsibilities. You are still a sinner. The sin is not the pregnancy. The sin is what you did. You slept with the person who was unmarried to you. And you're not supposed to. There are some of you here now. You're sitting and looking at me looking straight into my eyes believing I'll never believe you did such a thing because you don't look like you could ever do such a thing you're trying not to look away so I wouldn't think you're shy <laughs> but God knows you you can't live that kind of life and say everything is all right. Then next, let me mention something a little close to this. Because I, I may not come back to this. If you get married under that situation, you got real trouble. If you go on and get married under that situation, you have real trouble. Real trouble in your hands. You know sometimes people try to cover their sins. See? They've been sleeping with somebody and they say, well, what am I going to do? Uh, nothing to lose anyway. Well, she's fine. She's all right. There's no problem. Do I wish it wasn't like that? But, uh, well, we just go on and just um, I take her to the altar. So they get married. And they go on. So the sin is never known. The Bible says, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. That's a curse. But he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You say, well, well, as soon as we were through, we just knelt and we prayed. We asked God, we, we fasted. Doesn't make a difference in the world. Let me tell you something. In the house of God, this is very different. Fornication is not like every other sin. Don't you ever tell somebody where uh, it's just like it's just like if I had stolen or if I had lied, I just ask God to forgive me. And no, sir. Let me show you. It's different. All right, verse sixteen. What know ye not that he? which is joined to and hallowed is one body, for two said he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Did you hear that? A lady said she went to see a guy, and then when they got there, well, the guy, he, he shut the door, and then uh, he, he told me, he told me, um, we should have something. So I, I now said that I can. So he, he helped me. So I, I said, should leave me. He said, no. I said, leave me. He said, no. I said, we cry. He said, no. Then now, you know, you know, then, then, then now, then now. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? Why don't you scream? Holler for help. The Bible says what? Flee 
flee fornication. Sky! Zap! <laughs> hallelujah! I said hallelujah! I said hallelujah! A Christian lady, she was walking somewhere, and... Uh, The boss told her to come at an un unusual time. And the boss had been telling her he was going to sleep with her. And she said, impossible. Then he said, I've done it to many of you born again. She said, well, not me, Sha. What a fool. She should have resigned. She should have left there. But to her, devil is trying to tempt me. I'm going to prove that I'm, 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 I'm... Well, she went there. He had been telling her for a long time. And so she went there on this particular occasion. And then when she got in, he shut the door and grabbed her throat and brought out a knife and put her down and raped her right there and said, didn't I tell you? Then she got down and me. <laughs> well, she may, she may say, God is going to kill him. Oh, God didn't kill him since, is it now? No. I speak curses. No. He will know that he, he will know he did it to a child of God. No. The anointing upon me will bind him. No. Your foolishness puts you in that position. I tell ladies, be careful where you go. Don't tell me is the PCU leader said I should confess before everybody else comes. So I now went there. PCU leader. What in the world was that? Tell me, you can't say, well, I told me to come for everybody else, so when I went now, so, so something happened. Don't say it. Be wise. Be smart. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. So it's not like every other sin. You can't just say that. The Bible says, look at it here. Flee fornication. What? Flee, flee, flee. Somebody say flee. Flee. Flee, flee. flee fornication. Flee. By the time the guy is telling you, I just love you. Say, so, uh, thank, we thank the Lord. Then he says, no, I, I, I mean I love your shape. Don't go there again. Don't go there again. Thank God. Didn't you notice that Jesus, oh Lord, well, let, 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 let's, let's be true with this. He said, flee fornication, okay? Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. That means not with the body. But he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. Already he's telling you this, 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 they're not the same. They're not the same. They're not the same. Now you know, I, I think I have to push that to another service. I, I'll deal with that another service. Praise God. Well, let me answer some of these questions here very quickly. I'll deal with that in another service. But I, I think we've got somewhere along that, okay? Is that all right? All right. Then say, all right. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> now, listen to this. Dear Pastor Chris, thanks for the messages you preach. I have learned a lot through the Word. I am in love with a lady, and God told me she is mine. I am in love with a lady, and God told me she's mine. 
But she doesn't seem to believe God is bringing us together. Sometimes she doesn't even want to see me. But I still believe God chose her for me. Should I continue to hold on? No! <laughs> Hallelujah! I don't believe it either. She doesn't believe God is bringing you together. I don't believe it either. See, you have no business going ahead to a lady to say, God told me. You know, there are a lot of testimonies that can mislead us. We need to be careful. I mean, I heard a, a, a lady one time tell how she met her husband. She was, you know, well over 30, she was, uh, I guess, about, about 35 at the time. She wanted to get married so bad. And um, she said uh, on the street one day, she met this guy. And he was coming and she was coming. And they passed each other and the boozer went off. And so... The guy came back to her and told her she was to be his wife. And she was surprised and said, how come? How do you know that? Are you born again? The guy said, yeah. And they found out both of them were born again and they made the plans and they went on and they got married. And they got stuck. <laughs> Hallelujah. So well, they've given that testimony in several places and people, people like it. They like it. You don't know the fight that goes on when everybody's gone home to sleep. You don't know. They can't tell you that. make marriages on the street. Did you hear me? I said, we don't make marriages on the street. It doesn't happen that way. There's a better way. It's not on the street. Uh, I was looking at her. She was looking at me, so we, our eyes just met. <laughs> those are all worldly messages. All those things happen in the world. They all happen in the world. Hallelujah. Well, you want to know how to have it happen right? Then, when I call for the singles meeting, you come. We'll talk about it then. Praise the Lord. All right, dear pastor, my question is a simple one. Who is responsible for feeding and rents? My husband is an unbeliever. He asked me to have a joint account with him, but I know he will use the money to help his family and other people. What should I do? Yours in Christ, P-O-O. Are you still there? Did you hear that? The question is a simple one. Who is responsible for feeding and rents? Rents, paying rents. And then she says, my husband is an unbeliever. He asked me to have a joint account with him. But I know he will use the money to help his family, his family and other people. What should I do? Well, what's wrong with helping the family? And other people. But I think I know what you're talking about. Firstly, who's responsible for feeding and for rents? Who's responsible for feeding and for rents? Who is responsible? Hallelujah. Who is responsible? Are you still there? Why don't we read a little about the virtuous woman? Ah, I haven't answered the question yet. I haven't answered it yet. I just want to show you something, okay? The virtuous, virtuous woman. Proverbs chapter 31. 
Verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth simply trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Man, oh man, did you hear that? She will do him good, not evil. Some ladies will do him evil. She seeketh wool and flax and walketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. Oh. Oh. She bringeth her food from afar. Doesn't mean her own food, okay? She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. Come on, she's a businesswoman. All right? With the fruit of her hands, she planted a vineyard. She takes care of a garden. She's a gardener. She gathered her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. She perceived that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She laid her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretched out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reached for her hands to the needy. She is a giver. She is not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he seated among the elders of the land. Isn't that wonderful? She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth gathers unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. <clears throat> her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praised her. He praised her. Some of you men will never praise her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feared the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. <laughs> Hallelujah. So who's responsible for feeding and raise? The man. She may go and buy the food. That scripture didn't say where the money came from. How do I know it's a man? You go back to Genesis when God made the man. And then he said, man, you take care of this garden, okay? And God was going to pay him. He was living outside the garden. He was already alive. He was living outside the garden. So God said, now, you come into this garden, take care of this garden, and I'll pay you. You read it there. He said, you can eat of every tree that is in this garden. He's paying him. He's paying his staff. Praise God. Man is his staff. Adam is his staff. Well then, see, he got all the animals and he asked Adam to name them. He named them, and Adam needed somebody else to help him. And God already gave him a, a responsibility. And among all the animals, there was none that was good enough to help him. To help him. Help him, okay? Help him. Not carry his burden. Help him. So, he, God, made the woman to be a help suitable for him. So, he's going to help, or she's going to help you. Do something. She's not going to do it for you. She's going to help you. The man has a responsibility. The woman got married to him, followed him. Jesus, we can easily see that in Ephesians chapter 5, Jesus is the head of the body. As the man is the head of his wife. And Jesus provides. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down. If your wife can't say that about you, something's wrong with you. You ought to be the shepherd if you're a man. Except you're a hunter. 
But if you're the man, then you are the shepherd. Thank God a Christian man can really be a shepherd. If you're married to a non-Christian man, oh Lord Jesus is your shepherd. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if it's a Christian man, yeah, that's good. He's the shepherd. And if he's your shepherd, you ought not to want anything. The church looks to the Lord for supply. Then he, the Lord, is not the one who builds the house, puts the blocks. He supplies, but I've got to use it. So the wife can go ahead and, like we just read, buy it. Doesn't make any difference. But she's helping you. She's not the provider. You are the provider. The man ought to have the responsibility. Praise the Lord. For us Christians, don't say, well, it depends on how we arrange it on our own. If the man will not provide, what in the world is he doing with his money? But say, what are the case where the woman aims more than the man? <laughs> then the man should shut up and don't talk too much. Don't make her quit her job. No, just work harder. See, there are some ladies, some are really good. You say, what about the others? God only knows. See, some are good. You marry a good wife, she will, she will cause you to move forward. If you marry a good wife, not to criticisms and condemnation, no. She will encourage you to move forward. So you have visions, you'll move forward, she'll challenge you to move forward. A real good wife. She's a thinker, smart. If you're married to a lady that you have pounded so much she's afraid to talk to you, you will suffer. Really suffer. You're going to walk alone. A good woman will help, the Bible says, she will do him good and not evil. Amen. Amen. But here she's telling us, she's saying, uh, he asked me to have a joint account with him, but I know he will use the money to help his family and other people. What should I do? Uh, well, since he's a, uh, he's a non-Christian, here is my answer. Hmm. People always ask me, um, should we have a joint account or separate accounts? I often say both are good. Have a joint account for capital projects. And then have separate accounts so you can run your money and do the things you like to do. I mean, if you want to buy him a gift, you don't have to ask him for the money. There are a lot of things you like to do on your own. And it's wise to have your separate account. And then, for the, uh, for the joint account, you both have to decide what goes in there. And what comes out of it. And what it is used for. But where he is a non-Christian, it actually will depend on a lot of things. On a lot of things. If you think, like you have said, he, you think he will use the money to help his family and other people. Then, first you'll have to discuss with him on what that account is for. He wants to help his family, doesn't have to come from the joint account, can come from his own account. But if it's going to come from the joint account, both of you will have to discuss it. And by the way, what is a joint account if you are not a signatory to it? It is not a joint account if it's only your money there and you don't sign. Okay? If he tells it's a joint account, be sure there are not three signatories, there are two. Not he and his cousin. Or he and his mother and you. That's not a joint account. He and you, period. And there's no provision for single signatory sometimes. I don't know if you're catching what I'm saying. 
Otherwise, it ceases to be what you said it was. See, a lot of these things would depend on closeness between the husband and the wife, which we're not dealing with right now. We're answering the question. If she thinks, or if you think, that he would do this, like you said, he would spend the money on other things other than what you planned for, then be definite as to what the money is supposed to be for. So you don't sign if you don't agree. But remember, you cannot leave only two of you alone, okay? You must help others. Be sure to help others. We just read it, the virtuous woman who want to help. Praise God. Alright, here's another question here. Thank you for the opportunity to ask questions there, Pastor, through this medium. I want to get married to a Christian brother, but he has a 12-year-old son who he got from school. I don't know the mother. Please, Pastor, what should I do? I didn't catch that very well, did you? I want to get married to a Christian brother. But he has a 12 year old son who he got from school. I don't know the mother. Please, Pastor, what should I do? Your sister, B.A. <laughs> now, don't try checking in your mind who's B.A., who's B.A. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, what should I do? I want to get married to a Christian brother. He has a 12-year-old son. I don't know the mother. That says it all. That answers the question. You don't go ahead until you know what's going on. Otherwise, one of these days after you're married, one little lady will come knocking at the door. Are you the new girl? You're moving out. You need to know, dear sister, you need to know who the mother of the 12-year-old boy is. You need to know. And you can't know from only what he told you. You have to know. You have to be sure they're not getting married. You have to be sure they are not even married. You have to know what's going on. Don't go ahead and get married. Even that 12 year old boy. Boy. Man. God only knows what he'll do for you when he's 15. Could ask you out. Are you saying then, Pastor, that if uh, I want to get married to a guy who's having a 12-year-old son, I shouldn't? I didn't say so. I'm just answering this question. Okay? Now, if you have a question in that connection, you can ask some other time. Here's another one. <clears throat> well, last year around June... I met a Christian man who I believe very strongly I had heard clearly from God about. We started the relationship and I realized after some months that it was very one-sided. With me doing all the visiting to his office. As well as bearing the emotional burden of the relationship. When I voiced out my reservations to him... After about four months of suffering, in silence, he said if I didn't like the way the relationship was going, I should call it quits with him. Which we did, though to my bewilderment, feeling very miserable, I confided my confusion to a Christian friend of mine who told me, this is fairly long. Who told me if the relationship was of God, it will stand. And he will come back. So I shouldn't worry. 
And I had peace after that statement. And behold. Relax. <laughs> and behold, less than a week later, he came back. He apologized for his behavior and asked me if we could continue the relationship again. I told him only on the condition he would agree to change his attitude. And by not being so evasive with me, by not letting me know his address or meet his parents and so on. It was then he confided that he was living with a lady who he had pregnated. pregnated. <laughs> and she was due to have the baby any moment from then. But he had no intentions of marrying her anyway. And never had it. And it was due to circumstances. Why he was living with her in the first place as his parents had shown him the door and so on. For other reasons before the pregnancy had taken place. Since he seemed remorseful. <laughs> relax. Since he seemed remorseful and sincerely penitent, I decided to forgive him. Despite my initial shock and revulsion, and continued the relationship with him, hoping things would change for the better. I asked if he had told the girl about us, and he said no, but decided to do so as soon as she had delivered the baby, and her health was no longer in jeopardy. Well... She has delivered the baby and my friend has yet to tell her about us. These I know because I told him until he tells her he shouldn't contact me. Till now he has not yet contacted me. Relax. Even as I write, I can see he took me for a ride. But the reason why I put up with this relationship for so long, nearly a year, was because I had deep convictions, convictions it was from God. I would like to ask you a question, Pastor. If God has spoken to two people about marriage, but one of the people is misbehaving, does that annul the call of God concerning that marriage on that person's life? I have wanted to break free from this relationship for some weeks now, but I felt since God had called us together, I would be missing his best for me apart from being disobedient. Please advise me and, and once again thank you for the opportunity you have given me. Thank you. R A. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God, thank God. Hi. What do you think? You see, the, we have to look at the fundamental problem here. It's not really the technicalities um, about the guy and the girl who was giving birth and all that stuff. The main problem here is the fact that she already believed God called them together. 
And so she's ready because she believes God called them together. She's ready to forgive him for having a child through another lady. She's ready to forgive him for all other misbehavior. She's ready to forgive him for anything for one reason. Because she believes God called them together. And she doesn't want to be disobedient. No. It's not so. The Bible says she is free to be married to whomsoever she wills. Only in the Lord. That means so long as he's a Christian. She is free. God, having said that, will never insist that you marry a particular person. He will never insist that you marry a particular person. He will never do that. Because he already told you, you are free, you are at liberty to be married to whom you choose. So long as he's a Christian. So he's not going to come back, you know, writing for you that this is the guy I've chosen for you. You want to live with me? Follow this guy. He will never do that. If it came to you in a prophecy, reject it. If it came to you in a book, reject it. If it came to you in a vision, reject it. Don't believe it because God wouldn't contradict his word. He said, you're free. Praise God. I think that's simple enough. You're free. So don't you believe God called you both together? You know, one of the problems we have with certain people is the fact that they always want to spiritualize everything. They have a relationship. It's got to be based on the scripture. It's founded on 1 Peter 5.5. 5. That's the vision of that relationship. It's founded on it. So, when they ever have a problem, they're wondering, see, because they've cost themselves to come to believe it. No, God doesn't put us in bondage that way. And we should never allow ourselves to get into bondage that way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, I think that, that's just enough for that particular question. You don't have to follow him. You don't have to believe him. You don't have to believe yourself telling you that that's the guy you must marry. And my advice is, forget about him. If he comes back, beg him to go. <laughs> beg him to go. You know, people prey on the fears of men and women. And how sad. How sad. But it's up to you to decide. I want to say something to you about your home, lastly. Build your family on God's word. Build your family on God's word. See, at the end of the day, you will discover that that is the only foundation. And you would have wasted not only your time and resources, you would have wasted so much more running around trying to do it another way. Trying to do it another way. Another way. And there's some of you husbands, you believe that the wife, your wife, should be the one encouraging you in the Lord. I mean, you just, I don't know where you got that kind of belief from. See, but you, you just have that kind of belief that it's your wife who has the time for those things. You know, she can afford those spiritual things. Why you are messing around with the world, you don't have time with God or for God, you know, you are too busy going around for the money. 
And so she is the one who should be, you know, moving forward for the family. That's not the right attitude. God doesn't support such attitude. It's not right. Where some other ladies believe that since the man is the head of the family, well, he should be the one encouraging me. Don't see it that way. For as long as you see it that way, you are pushing your responsibility to somebody else. You, are, you think that someone should have the responsibility of trying to drag you along spiritually. And that's not right. None of us should have that sense of uh, 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 subsidence to anybody spiritually. We're not supposed to. I mean, you can't even say it is the pastor who's supposed to be encouraging me spiritually. Don't say supposed to be. Don't shake your responsibilities. You have a responsibility to stand in God's word. You have a responsibility. You see, I have a responsibility of teaching the word. I have a responsibility of doing what I'm doing. But you also have a responsibility of listening to it and accepting it and having faith in it. You have a responsibility of practicing it. So you cannot put it on somebody else and say, well, I've not been going to church because of him. You can't do that. And both of you must always be wise enough to realize that your marriage is more than an institution. It's more than an institution. Your home is more than that. It's supposed to be a dwelling place for God. Amen? It's supposed to be a dwelling place for God. I trust that in our next service we'll be able to move further than this. And like I said last week, if you have a question, did we embarrass anybody? No. So don't think you'll be embarrassed. So you have a question, you have something you'd like to share, it could be a testimony, no problem. Why don't you go ahead and write it and send it to me in the office. We'll treat it very, very privately as we have done. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Of course, if it's, if it's something that you don't want out here, we we'll also know. You don't have to indicate it there, but if it's for this purpose, so others can learn. You see, these questions... I believe that several others have learned from them. How many of you learned something tonight? Thank you. God bless you. Please kindly like and subscribe to the Christian Life YouTube channel for more. Thank you. Do you have your Bible here? Imagine yourself 2,000 years ago coming for a meeting where Jesus is teaching and you're sitting in front of him knowing that he is the son of God knowing all you know about him today imagine that you are sitting 2,000 years back now you're sitting before Jesus and he's teaching what would you expect talk to me <laughs> what would you expect you know sometimes we don't know what to expect it's one of the problems that a lot of Christians have. They go to church. They listen to the preaching or the teaching of the, the word. But they don't know what to expect. They don't even know whether they're supposed to expect something. You know. So they're sitting there. 
listening, and then they pray, sing some songs, go back home, and don't even know whether or not they were supposed to have gotten anything. When we say that we are blessed, a lot of times we don't even know what it is to be blessed. Because you see, a lot of terms that we read in the Bible are not in uh, common everyday communication in our day. So when we use them, we don't really know what they're supposed to mean. For example, when someone says to you, God bless you, you think it's a nice greeting, a good Christian greeting or a greeting from a godly man or woman. We don't know what that's supposed to communicate. God bless you. So what is God bless you? What is it to be blessed? But you see, in the days that the Bible writes about in history, when you study in Genesis and Exodus and all through to the prophets, and then also in Jesus' day, and into the writings of the apostles when they used that expression they had an idea what they were talking about they had an idea they knew what it was to be blessed they knew what it was if a man got a blessing from God you knew it they knew what it meant when you said that man is a blessed man blessed and because we are not familiar with these words we don't know what they really mean we don't know what to get out of them if I said, you will be taxed tomorrow, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. Because that means some money will be taken from you tomorrow. You're familiar with that. So we are very much familiar with things taken from us. And then we're familiar with being paid we don't understand blessings because in our day nothing goes for nothing you know what I mean we want to deserve something if we don't deserve it we don't expect it see that's a problem if we don't think we deserve it we don't expect it if we deserve it, we want to fight for our rights. We feel like, I deserve this. I deserve this treatment. I deserve this thing or that thing. If we don't think we deserve it, okay. And we come with that understanding to the things of God. So, when, when we say we are blessed, oh yeah, religious cliche. Yes, we are blessed. Um, I don't understand why my heart is beating too fast. Sir, are you blessed? Oh yes, I'm blessed, praise God, amen. Looks like I have a heart attack. Um, are you blessed, sir? Oh yes, I'm blessed, amen, praise God. I don't understand. I'm so broke. My finances are in shambles. Oh, really? Are you blessed? Yes, I'm blessed. Praise God. You see, there's a disconnect. We don't know what it is to be blessed.
for many others it's that old song that we used to sing long ago oh god our help in ages past our hope for years to come says nothing about today you see our help in ages past our hope for years to come but my problem is the problem of today and I need today's God today you see it it's the kind of mentality that we've been given consciously or unconsciously and so when we find that there's some teaching like I'm bringing to you now some teaching that somehow um, goes against that religious understanding that we have built up we go like hey 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 um, isn't there a problem here uh, these prosperity teachers or these miracle healing preachers um, you got to watch them carefully see because they're not used to walking in the realm of the supernatural let me explain something to you in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 17 a marvelous awesome declaration of Almighty God through the Apostle Paul if any man be in Christ finish it for me you know it right let's go again if any man be in Christ let's do it again are you looking at your Bible uh, now if you're not looking at your Bible you are expecting me to assume that you know it right if you don't have a Bible look at someone's Bible I just want us to get it right okay you see the accurate teaching of the Word of God will put you over in life the accurate teaching of the Word of God. Now, something we need to understand about Christianity is that it is founded on the Word, born of the Word, founded on the Word, prospers in the Word, sustained by the Word. All right? And can only be victorious by the Word. Don't forget that. Hey, come on. Let's go again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If any man be in Christ again one more time if any man be in Christ I, I don't finish that yet let's go again this first part if any man uh-huh He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Finish it. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's analyze that verse. First it says, if, if any man, anybody, doesn't matter who you are, if anybody be in Christ, anyone, the condition is, to be in Christ if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation now notice he didn't say he will be a new creation he shall be a new creation he might be a new creation they say that he says if any man be in Christ he is is that a promise 
Let's get it straight. It's either the word of God means exactly what it says or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then we have all men most miserable for daring to believe something that's not right. But the word of God means exactly what it says. If any man be in Christ, that's what it is to be born again. The Bible says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. First Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. All right. We're baptized into one body, into the body of Christ. So we are in Christ when we are born again. All right. Now, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's not going to be. He is. Now, when I asked your question, are you born again? And you said yes, and you knew that you're born again. That means you are in Christ. That means the word is talking about you. You are a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. It's not a promise. It's a statement of fact. It's a present hour reality. It is in the now of your life. You're not going to be, you are. Now, it says nothing about whether or not you feel so. You don't have to feel so. This is God's picture of you. This is God's understanding of you. This is God's declaration of you. If any man be in Christ, he is. He is. So what should my talk be like? I am a new creation. I am in Christ. I am a new creation. I am. I am a new creation. I don't feel so. I don't have to feel so. So it's nothing about feeling. I am a new creation. Okay. Okay. The next word says, all things are passed away. All right. Let me put it the way sometimes we think. All things are passed away if I feel so. All things are passed away when I think so. All things are passed away. I'm not sure whether it's all of them really. Some things are passed away. <laughs> What does the word say? All Come again. All things. All things are passed away. And all things. All. A L L. What's the meaning of all? With the exception of nothing. things are become I want you to listen to the tenses if we will just